Hello and welcome to the Field Fisher webinar on CBD. Just going to give it 30 seconds or so for people to complete joining. I can see our attendee numbers just clicking up uh, and then I'll introduce today's session. Well, welcome again. Uh, this is Field Fisher's uh, first seminar in a series on CBD uh, and cannabis, uh, and it forms part of an ongoing series of thought leadership materials for those of you interested in uh, investment, development, production, distribution, uh, and provision of cannabis and CBD products. Um, I'll introduce my colleagues shortly, um, but the plan for today is for, for me to present some of the topics, um, some of which were covered in our white paper issued last week, and some of which have arisen even in the days since that was published. Uh, and then my colleagues Hastings, Tim and, and Stephanie will rejoin us uh, for questions um, after about uh, 35 about 30 minutes uh, and you'll be most welcome to ask questions. Our webinar is set up so that you're on mute but please do use the chat box and Chloe our moderator will let me know uh, if there are questions and we will share those amongst our panel of experts. So I understand you can see my slides uh, and I'm going to press on with the presentation. The topics I thought we would cover today uh, include novel foods, uh, the UK's food state, uh, safety agencies, what's happened in the EU and in particular uh, the recent Canavape decision and then the even more recent decision uh, at the United Nations uh, uh, Drugs uh, Committee uh, on the 2nd of December. We'll touch on the issue of, of cannabis and CBD in the more medical sense uh, and then as I say we'll open up uh, the topic to greater questions. Um, some of which we've had in advance. The seminar today seems timely given that so much is happening. The first question or topic that I wanted to just touch on, um, and I know that some of our attendees have been asking about this, is whether we're talking about CBD and cannabis in the sense of foods or whether we're talking about them uh, in the sense of medicines. And really it's both, and indeed it's wider than just food or medicines. And as no doubt you'll hear from my colleague Tim later, actually this can be quite a circular thing. Whether uh, a CBD product is a medicine uh, in part depends what claims are made for it. Uh, so products where uh, advertising for medical claims are made gives rise to an obligation to seek a marketing authorization and the necessary approvals to have a medicine on the market. We'll also be talking about CBD as it arises in many other products, ingested products in particular, food and other edibles, beverages and tinctures. Uh, and in this situation, as you'll see, uh, our broad approach is to view these as novel foods. Um, those, those foods aren't hemp foods. Um, and we'll touch briefly on CBD in other products such as cosmetics and vaping. So the timeline that in particularly impacts uh, the topics that we're talking about today is set out on this slide uh, and it's been an evolution that's been quite troublesome and complex for those of you operating in this sector. CBD um, was reclassified or the classification was clarified in January 2019 when all extracts from the cannabis sativa plant and also synthetically derived uh, cannabinoids were placed on the European uh, list of novel foods as a classified uh, as a classification. Uh, this, this was a reflection of their assessment that these foods had not been routinely consumed uh, in Europe prior to, to key dates. It's different um, for, for hemp products and cold pressed hemp oil um, and similar products are not on the novel food classifications. So once it was clear that these things would be treated as novel foods, uh, it became necessary to understand what that meant for having these products on the market. 
Uh, in the UK, we've been led by our Food Safety Agency, who in February 2020 made an announcement that it would be uh, a requirement for uh, those providing and uh, supplying such uh, material, uh, such novel foods into the market to have an, uh, in place, at very least, uh, a validated application uh, for recognition as a novel food by the 31st of March 2021. That put in uh, train um, a, a, a number of um, priorities and lots of our clients approached us at that stage about the process of seeking novel food recognition, both in the UK and across the EU. The EU position was then further complicated in July 2020, when the European Commission uh, uh, suggested or recommended that CBD extracts were perhaps not food, but should instead be recognised as narcotics. This threw into chaos everybody's approach to the uh, applications they had in train for their CBD edibles, foods and beverages to be recognised as novel foods. Uh, and the concern was, and to some extent still remains, that the narcotic classification brings about an entirely different approach to whether CBD products can be placed on the market. Things continue to move on, and uh, I will talk in a little bit more detail about the court case that happened in France in November, uh, the Canavape decision, which has made a difference to the European approach to the uh, ability for CBD products to be uh, moved and sold uh, in the EU. And then, as I say, only on the 2nd of December did we have a further reclassification um, by the UN in relation to uh, the classification of CBD uh, and cannabis on various schedules and treaties. I mentioned there the inevitable uh, that the EU will complete the transition period and its exit from the EU uh, at the end of this month. And part of what's driven our refreshed and approach and our recent white paper last week has been the fact that our departure from the EU does create the opportunity for the EU to do things differently, particularly in the regulation of cannabis and CBD products within our own domestic legislation. And I think we see emerging the possibility that certainly our food safety agency is keen to press ahead with the novel foods approach and hasn't really put in peril um, the applications in the same way as the wider EU uh, did by bringing into the equation the suggestion of narcotics. And as I mentioned earlier in the timeline, uh, we're now looking at March 2021, which is when the uh, food safety agencies have said that CBD products must have validated novel food applications in order to be on our shelves. Um, so I here set out uh, a little bit of the detail uh, from our food safety agency. And one point to note, uh, that covers England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And my next slide will just pick up on the slightly different position taken um, by our equivalent body for Scotland. The requirement is that businesses need to have submitted and fully validated, which is a recognition by the regulator that the application materials are complete even if the uh, actual recognition as a novel food has not been completed by the 31st of March 2021. So if you're uh, someone who has CBD products on your shelves, um, you'll be wanting to know that your suppliers have this in train and seeking to have them evidence their validated applications. And if you're a manufacturer or supplier, this is what you're aiming for, to have your dossier completed and provided. In the meantime, so between now and the 31st of March 2021, businesses can continue to sell their existing CBD products, uh, providing that they're not incorrectly labelled, are not unsafe and don't contain any of the substances which are unlawful under the UK's drugs legislation. In terms of safety, we saw our um, our government announced some safety guidance for the first time on CBD earlier this year, 
with a suggestion that uh, CBD shouldn't be taken by pregnant women, uh, mothers who are breastfeeding and anyone taking other medications uh, and that uh, anyone taking a CBD uh, product should not consume more than 70 milligrams a day. So for the first time, we also have safety guidance, uh, which is something to have in mind in terms of uh, both the labelling and uh, the availability of these products more generally. Uh, and the other thing to note is that um, when the Food Safety Agency made its announcement on the 13th of February 2020, it made clear that its um, tolerance of what was on the shelves related to what was already in the marketplace, and it's those um, uh, products that need to have their validated applications. Uh, no new products should have been brought to the market um, since the 13th of February without a novel food uh, recognition and there haven't been any. So there has in theory um, been a, an inability to bring new products to the market while everyone queues up to get the necessary uh, uh, recognition as a novel food. So again, something to consider which is uh, to be aware that there shouldn't have been those new products reaching the marketplace uh, and also this key deadline of the 31st of March. Uh, now in Scotland, uh, they haven't made the same announcement about the uh, end of March date. Uh, they've made a broader statement recognising um, that uh, CBD products have now been declared to be novel foods and recognising that there are no CBD extract products authorised as novel foods under the EU regulation, uh, thereby suggesting there really ought to be no CBD extract products in the marketplace. Uh, they haven't been clear about what will happen uh, and, and at what point it might happen in terms of enforcing a withdrawal of such products. They say they're working with local authorities and other partners uh, to keep those uh, products that are on the market under review and certainly um, they're looking closely at appropriate labelling and again the same safety indications. Um, but I expect, although they haven't announced, that they will also be looking at tightening up on enforcement of these products uh, as we tick into March, April of next year. And by enforcement, uh, the indication has been that they will work with trading standards um, officers uh, throughout the UK who will visit uh, premises and properties selling CBD products and look to find um, a verification that the necessary applications are in place. Turning on then, um, I've called this slide a new approach in the EU and, and the consequences of Canavape. Um, as I mentioned in the timeline, in July 2020, the European Commission, probably to most people's surprise, uh, recommended that cannabis flowers, uh, cannabis oil, CBD extracts should no longer be labelled as food products, but instead as narcotics. And they drew that from, as we'll see later, the various international treaties on how drugs are classified. In France, uh, Canavape and its directors were seeking to place on the market uh, a number of actual, actually vaping products rather than um, food products uh, containing synthetic CBD and this was a prosecution against the directors for uh, their attempts to sell a CBD containing product in France. France has uh, currently, although it will now be required to review these, domestic laws that prevented uh, CBD products being sold. Um, and so the case was escalated up to the uh, Court of Justice for the European Union on the specific point of whether France could properly have domestic laws that prevented uh, the sale of a CBD containing product uh, when in fact obviously we have principles in the EU of free movement of goods. Uh, and the court case uh, looked at the issues around CBD, both um, naturally arising and synthetic CBD, and didn't find there to be uh, the evidence of harm which would have formed the basis of a, of a national ban or, or of a ban um, uh, more widely. 
Uh, and so they gave primacy to the idea that CBD products should be able to move freely around the EU and be sold, um, thus taking away the idea that individual countries could perhaps restrict that. They didn't rule out the possibility of domestic legislation that might limit CBD, but they made it extremely clear that um, in order to ban CBD products in a country, there would need to be evidence of harm uh, based on available scientific data. And they expressed their reservations as to whether there really was a risk um, with CBD products, I must emphasize, um, and, and therefore they doubted whether France could uphold its CBD ban. In the course of uh, determining this case, the court had to look at the various um, international conventions uh, on the way that drugs have been classified in the past and the difficulty is that while cannabis appears as you'll see in a moment on a number of the schedules the classification of CBD is a little unclear and remains quite unclear uh, and although there was an argument that one very literal interpretation might lead to its classification as a drug um, the court said that that interpretation would be contrary to the general spirit of the convention um, and its objectives in terms of classifying drugs to protect the health and welfare of mankind. Uh, and they therefore strongly indicated that CBD shouldn't be caught by those definitions. So this helps both on the European level, where I think domestic laws limiting the sale of CBD products will have to be reviewed, uh, and also potentially uh, at the international level uh, where this point has, has now been looked at. But probably more important is to revisit those U UN um, uh, schedules uh, and the, the various treaties that do classify drugs. And um, as recently as the 2nd of November, uh, the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs was asked to consider a series of recommendations from the World Health Organization about whether we had historically got the classification of various cannabis products correct. Um, most significantly, and in fact, the only change that was voted through uh, was a vote, a very close vote, 27 in favour of the changes and 25 against, which has now led to the removal of cannabis and cannabis resin from a category um, which was Schedule 4 of the 1961 Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And so we see cannabis and cannabis resin removed from Schedule 4. Uh, these were drugs that were described as some of the most dangerous and deadly and other drugs that you would find on that list would include cocaine, heroin, methadone, morphine, opium. Um, and you can perhaps understand that a greater differential between those kinds of drugs and cannabis and cannabis resin um, has found, although not unanimously at all, uh, recognition in the reclassification. The WHO had recommended that move because the kind of harms that are caused uh, by cannabis and cannabis use um, are not at the same level as those other drugs. And by reclassifying it, they've opened the possibility of there being greater opportunities for research, particularly uh, in the use, medical use of cannabis uh, and cannabis related preparations. So that now becomes much easier internationally because we're not now dealing with a schedule for uh, drug when thinking about developing treatments. But the WHO had made a number of other recommendations, um, uh, such as removing um, extracts and tinctures of cannabis from Schedule 1. Um, Schedule 1 lists highly addictive um, uh, medicines and those that are uh, uh, also liable to, to, to lead to addictions. Uh, and the proposal was to delete extracts and tinctures from Schedule 1 uh, and also potentially add a footnote which would have clarified this point that the uh, court had to look at in the Canavape case, um, which would have made clear that CBD preparations that don't contain THC um, should have should not be caught by these various uh, uh, schedules and, and classifications of drugs. Um, but um, 
that the, the vote did not go through, that amendment will not be happening contrary to the WHO recommendation. Um, in commentary that I've read since, um, both the US and the EU took the view that actually uh, understanding what is and isn't on Schedule 1, what is um, whether, whether CBD products are caught, is actually something that countries can be left to work out themselves and can use domestic legislation uh, to give guidance on. And in fact, the EU, perhaps um, reflecting those comments from the Commission earlier in the year, still appears to have some reservations about the potential harm uh, and addictive qualities, even of CBD. So finally, um, just then, uh, turning to the issue of, of CBD and cannabis in a more medical setting. Um, the, U, the UN uh, reclassification does, as I say, open the way for, I think, much more clinical research into cannabis products. Um, we've seen uh, CBD being used in many different types of diseases. Um, I, I've listed some there that you can uh, easily identify and which many of our clients are working uh, with. Um, often the CBD quantities are at a far greater scale than, um, than the quantities one tends to see in the um, food supplements and tinctures available um, uh, when the product is not marketed as having medicinal purposes. And I think, I think we're of a, almost of a very different order when we're looking at some of the medical treatments. Certainly in the UK, we have a number of psychiatric um, uh, medical case studies and pilots underway to look at the benefits of uh, CBD products on mental health and anxiety. And it's clear that at those higher levels, uh, CBD interacts with other medications and hence the uh, guidance issued earlier in the year uh, that CBD products shouldn't be taken uh, for non-medical purposes when people are taking other medications. Uh, there is plenty of evidence emerging. We have a recent paper um, out on the 9th of December by um, David Nutt um, and a campaign group in the UK called End Our Pain. And they've done a retrospective study of, I think, uh, 20, no, 10 patients, um, all of whom uh, are families with with children with severe epilepsy. And they've been taking a, a variety of drugs, but they tend to be either uh, Bedrolite or Bendica. So um, medications with an, an element of THC in it, often a fairly small quantity of THC, certainly for Bedrolite and CBD. And they're reporting um, very significant clinical changes. We know in the UK and in England, uh, market access for cannabis-based therapeutic medicines is limited by guidance issued um, by our um, by the, by the organisation Nice um, in terms of certainly whether it will be remunerated uh, by the National Health Service. And one of the big challenges that they've thrown out is that there is a lack of clinical trials evidence uh, and proper research in this area. And for those families who genuinely know and believe that medicinal cannabis will make a huge difference to their lives, I think there is great pressure building to try and put the case um, for both future clinical studies, but also these retrospective studies to try and evidence uh, how lives uh, have been changed. Uh, recent survey data suggests that as many as possibly 1.4 million individuals in the UK are using cannabis without a prescription. Um, often obviously sourced, therefore, from the black market, uh, and, and possibly as many as 11 or 12 percent of epilepsy su sufferers are using cannabis-based medicines. But despite the change to our legislation uh, in November 2018, which has allowed for the prescribing of, of cannabis-based medicines by doctors, the evidence is that combined with the limits, as I say, set by NICE, and uh, the legal uh, requirements this can only be prescribed by certain more senior levels of doctor. Um, the suggestion is as few as 20 to 30 NHS prescriptions have actually been issued um, for cannabis-based medicines. And there is a real um, anxiety and concern uh, that this uh, door that was opened is not actually being taken full advantage of. And again, we work with a number of families and uh, uh, campaign groups and um, 
those working in medicines uh, to explore how the changes to the legislation um, have and have not yet opened up this market. So I wanted to take you through some of the key issues as we see them. I think that if you are in the market either investing directly or um, owning and uh, operating your own uh, businesses that are involved in either the manufacture or distribution of cannabis and CBD products, it is an exciting time, but it's not one without uh, challenges. The legal position does seem to be shifting. Uh, interpretations of the legal position seem to be shifting. And we're seeing divergence, in my view, between what the UK uh, and the EU are doing. And obviously, there has been divergence within the EU, with every country having its own domestic overlay. Um, so it's a difficult place to navigate. Um, there are all sorts of issues. And I guess that you need a combination of um, uh, experience and expertise to help govern you through some of these hurdles. We're going to broaden out in a moment to our uh, panel discussion. Um, I should have properly introduced myself at the beginning um, as Sarah Elson uh, and I co-head our regulatory group here in the UK. I do a lot of work in health and life sciences and hence the interest in cannabis and CBD, where I've come at it from a variety of regulatory challenges, um, everything from custom seizures uh, through, to, through, through to novel foods and, and medical marketing authorizations. I'm going to be joined in a moment by colleagues who look at issues uh, from from the advertising perspective, from the intellectual property perspective, and from regulatory perspectives uh, across our European network. Uh, and one thing I'd just say in, in closing this session is that um, Field Fisher has a network of offices across Europe, and our recent white paper very much drew on the benefits of having experts in different countries. Uh, and it only served to highlight to me how different uh, approaches can be. So often we are able to discuss amongst ourselves and give some strategic advice as well as the more black and white legal advice for clients who are trying to work out which markets maybe uh, provide them with the best opportunities or uh, maybe the fewest barriers in terms of reg regulatory compliance as they take their new products to market. So um, I'm going to welcome uh, back to our screen so you can see live and moving pictures of my colleagues. Uh, Stephanie Griffinelder, who's from our Munich office uh, and uh, provides plenty of advice to people uh, particularly wanting to expand in this market in Germany. Uh, Hastings Guys, a partner in our IP and technology protection team who looks at the intellectual property issues, uh, all aspects of these for those people bringing uh, CBD and cannabis products to market, and Tim Ricard in our commercial intellectual IP team, uh, who deals a lot with the advertising of products. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my slides uh, and ask Chloe um, if there are questions that we can uh, help our, our attendees with. Yeah, definitely. And um, we have had a couple of questions come in. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody else who hasn't had chance to submit their questions, do use your questions drop down on your control panel um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, so first up, I think this is probably for you, Tim. Um, from a consumer advertising point of view, what are the basic rules on advertising or marketing CBD products here in the UK? Yeah, so I think the first thing to note is that, um, like with the regulatory side of things, um, this is a complex area of the law in the UK, um, which is fair to say it's only just emerging. Um, so there have been very few advertising adjudications in this area, which I think is testament to that. So we still have a lot to learn. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean marketers and CBD companies, but even the regulator responsible for advertising in the UK, so the ASA, the Advertising Standards Agency. Um, but we've already touched on the regulatory issues, but these are important in first determining whether you're able to advertise the CBD products in the first place in the UK. So the first step is always to ensure um, that you meet the regulatory definition of CBD um, and it mustn't contain more than the permitted limits of THC. And once we're sure that we've met that test and are complying with applicable CBD laws relating to the sale, 
cultivation, supply licensing, i.e. whether it's a controlled substance or not, um, then like with any other product that you might be advertising here, you have to comply with general advertising consumer protection laws um, to ensure that any claims you make are capable of, of substantiation and they're not misleading. Uh, and there are many rules on this. For example, you know, you mustn't use exaggerations. You mustn't claim your product is safe. I know Sarah touched on safety. But you need robust supporting data to be able to do that. Um, you shouldn't use misleading surveys to support your claim. Um, you know, if you're using influencers, ensure they comply with transparency requirements. Uh, and one of the biggest issues, crucially, uh, is if you are intending to use social media, you must ensure that you comply with the platform rules. Um, and that's very much currently in a state of uncertainty. Uh, for example, although Facebook does not specifically mention CBD in its platform rules, uh, it does continue to reject the vast majority of CBD ads on there. Um, so you also need to consider how your product is going to be classified. So is it a food or food supplement? Is it a medicine or presented as a medicine? Is it a cosmetic product? Um, because the nature of the product itself will have an impact on the applicability of certain advertising rules and restrictions. Um, because many food, many products such as foods, food supplements, etc., they're already subject to their own sector-specific advertising rules, um, as well as compliance with general advertising rules, which are quite strict. Um, and one other key rule for marketers in this area uh, for CBD products is that ads must always be socially responsible. So you should be very careful not to associate the product with illicit drugs. Um, and although those who are likely to see CBD product ads would generally be aware that CBD is derived from the cannabis plant, you should always take particular care to ensure that any imagery and wording in particular which accompanies any factual statements about CBD, um, about the content of a product, does not link it to the recreational drug cannabis. Um, and even images of medicinal cannabis are currently prohibited on Facebook. Um, so in summary, there are a number of rules to comply with, but we are expecting more opportunities to arise in this area. Brilliant, thanks, Tim. Um, so moving on, um, what should businesses be planning in terms of IP protection for new CBD brands? And I think that's probably best placed at you, Hastings. On mute. Um, sure, thanks, Chloe. Um, so, actually, one of the issues there are a couple of points here that I think it is worth worth mentioning, and one of them ties on to what Tim was saying about the advertising um, position. So, a lot of um, IP registries. Obviously, you're bringing new brand to market. It's quite important to ensure that you secure effective um, registered rights in your proposed brand name and logos. Um, the IP registries, particularly the European one, the EU IPO, are extremely squeamish about logos and brand names that create potential associations with with recreational cannabis use. So, um, for example, uh, you know we've had applications run into trouble because they've used the word weed in them. Um, I've heard about issues connected with stylization, stylized cannabis leaves and so on. Um, and, and that's part of obviously this, this uh, as CBD comes up in the market and the, the consumer perceptions change around this product, um, that will probably become less acute. But at the moment, um, don't be tempted to, to lean too heavily on associations with uh, recreational cannabis. Um, the second point is one that actually applies to uh, launching new brands in any new uh, growth market. So you're launching a new brand into a mature market. Um, you look around, you see what else is out there, you spot a gap for your brand where you think you can differentiate yourself and you go and you're quite unlucky then if you bump into somebody else who's brought a similar brand at the same time that you weren't aware of. Um, still a good idea to check, but you know, it, it, it's pretty bad luck if you run into trouble. Uh, a situation like the current situation where a lot of businesses are bringing new CBD products onto the market at the same time, that risk of collision is much, much higher. And when you look around at the market, what other brands are already out there, you're not seeing all of the other products that are also arriving onto the market, will be arriving onto the market, where people have already 
begun the process of securing IP rights. So it's much more important in a situation like this to uh, take steps to do the thorough trademark clearance, ensure that uh, other people haven't already filed applications for potentially similar brand names, potentially similar logos to the brand that you're hoping to run with. Um, because given the timing of the, the growth and development of this market, uh, it, it's very likely that there will be people's, uh, people will have been securing rights already that won't yet be visible on the market because they won't yet have launched. So there's a much greater need to check what other people have been filing before you you launch your uh, proposed new brand or apply for your proposed new trademarks. Um, and as I say, that applies to launching in any growth market, but uh, it's the CBD market where we've seen a lot of activity with new brands over the last couple of years. Um, it's been particularly acute, this issue. So that really is a recommendation I'd make. Thanks, Hastings. I, I was just going to um, perhaps bring in, in Stephanie there, because I think both those answers obviously draw on, on your UK expertise. And I know we've quite often then had to look at other jurisdictions. So, um, Stephanie, is it similar? Are there distinctions that you would draw, uh, say, in the German market? Yeah, um, basically, um, the the legal framework is quite similar to what um, you have described before and that's quite natural because we have um, the EU legislation which is the basis um, for for also for the German um, regulations but nevertheless um, we have some um, specialities un under German law which um, result from a, a, a different implementation of, of the European set of rules. Um, so the basic principles are the same and are exactly as, as described by the three um, of you. And um, for placing the products on the market under German law, it's also um, very important to, to get it into the right class of products. So you also have to, dis, uh, to decide whether it's a medicine, e either, e e um, either that it um, contains THC and is therefore a medicine, or also if it's only CBD, um, uh, it has only CBD content, uh, con um, content but um, might be advertised as a medicine, and then it, it would um, only um, because of this advertising fall within the scope of, of medicinal products. So this is the first distinction. And, and if you manage to um, be outside the scope of, of medicines, um, you, you have also to, to um, look at the rules for these specific um, product categories. So for foods and food supplements, and here you have the same that for foods and food supplements, you need to think about the novel food registration. Um, if if um, only CBD extracts or CBD isolates are used, and um, and 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 here it's it's very important to take into account the um, um, the, the regulation on um, health claims about foods and um, and food supplements because um, for for foods it's only allowed to um, use um, specific claims that are authorized by the um, by the EU Commission and are in, in, included in a register of nutrition and health claims. And for the time being, there are no specific authorized claims for CBD products so far. So the only way you could manage to do um, some some health related claims is that you combine um, a generic health claim with a with another specific health claim which has already been included in the register so for example if you would like to go for some stress release um, health claims you could could do so um, that you um, compose your product also including some um, other stress release food um, ingredients like um, vitamin b for example or near c and then you have a, a health claim that has already been approved um, by the EU Commission and you can use that um, because of, of the vitamin B, for example, that is also in the product. Um, but you can also have um, the, the CBD um, in it and, and make an indirect claim at least. Um, so that, But that's the, the only possible possibility to get some kind of health-related claims into to foods um, at, at the moment. 
Thank you, Stephanie. Chloe, I think we've, I can see in the chat, we've got some other questions. Do you want to fire them at us? Yeah, I think just sticking with the IP theme, um, Hastings, how can we value cannabis trademark IP? Um, that's a that's a, a wonderful question. Any question about valuing uh, trademarks is is a wonderful question, and one of the reasons why trademarks and brand IP is so interesting, um, uh, intellectually and commercially, is because value is such an amorphous concept for a brand. Some of the most well. I suspect that the most valuable assets in the world are brands. Uh, so they can be hugely valuable, but at the same time, a brand that doesn't have any traction yet, a brand that doesn't yet have a base of recognition, a base of consumer trust, doesn't really have any value at all. So something as an investor to be, well, if you're an investee, this is something to uh, take advantage of. If you're an investor, this is something to be wary of, is that it's possible to spend quite a lot of money building a registered IP portfolio around a brand or a trademark, um, which obviously comes in as a capitalized cost potentially. Um, however, that brand or trademark is only really as valuable as the trust that is gained with consumers and the traction is has gained in the market that's the real heart of brand value so at the moment i mean i would be tempted to say you know if you're talking about the, the fact that uh, a brand relates to a cbd product rather than i know a new toothpaste or something doesn't itself impact the value the value derives from the underlying business however given that cbd products like um well, like pharmaceutical products and food products entail a degree, require a higher degree of trust from the consumer because the consumer needs to trust that the product is good quality and means that uh, it's been produced responsibly and that the information is correct. Uh, I suspect that CBD brands will find it easier to gain meaningful uh, consumer trust and gain traction and add value that way because consumers will come to trust and rely on the brands that are most uh, reliable and best thought of and most consistent in producing um, products that are uh, accurately made, accurately labeled, all of that. So there is an opportunity to build very strong brands there, but um, I'd wait and see how those brands are building before you splash out a lot of cash buying one. I think one of the um, interesting things that we've certainly uh, discussed at some of our um, cannabis related events that, that we've held is that a lot of the people in the room are not interested in medicinal cannabis per se. Their investments have been in, in, in edibles and beverages and even pet food and all the rest of it. But um, that actually the, the, what you talk about, Hastings, the confidence and trust will come as uh, the reputation of cannabis and CBD moves away from the kind of the recreational historic associations that it's had. And if it becomes routinely a prescribed thing um, in hospitals and for children with profound epilepsy and for people who are recovering from chemotherapy side effects and those kind of things, that that trust in it being something that people ingest will have a kind of knock on uh, effect to, to the much broader ways that CBD may be consumed. Um, the if other point I, I want to pick up, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, no, I just, just coming back on, on that point, I, if I just jump across uh, across sector briefly with one very, uh, very brief example, one of my favorite examples, Nurofen, um, as people probably know, ibuprofen comes off patent in 1983, I think. Um, and they rebranded Brufen to ibuprofen in 19, uh, during that last um, part of the patent period. Um, Ibu uh, Nurofen is still five times more expensive than generic ibuprofen 30 years later. There's a huge amount of value that is caught up in the consumer trust in Nurofen as a brand, even though the underlying product is generic. And CBD products are exactly where there is that kind of opportunity, uh, I would have thought, if it is built and developed properly and the consumer trust is built effectively. Yeah. Hopefully it'll last um, 30 years if you get it right. 
<laughs> um, and I just wanted to pick up on on something when Tim was talking about, um, you know, some of the the platforms. Um, several of the pieces of work that the team have done this year have been for uh, clients who um, perhaps are doing online sales of, of CBD products of various sorts. Um, if you use uh, PayPal, uh, we know that they have been very uh, vigorous in their wanting to have verification that there is regulatory compliance. Um, and that's been projects that obviously then have gone across multiple jurisdictions so that you can get sign off from PayPal uh, because if they find out that you're using their PayPal functionality uh, for the payment of CBD products, that will be a potential issue. Now, I'm mindful of the time. We've already reached uh, 10.45. Um, I know that there were uh, a couple of questions, um, one of which was uh, around uh, consortiums. Um, we haven't, as a law firm, sought to kind of form any kind of consortium. I know a number of the trade bodies have. Um, and uh, just to kind of uh, recap for, for people, I think that the, the idea has been that when novel food applications are approved, they'll be approved for, um, I'm going to use a non-technical phrase, but you know, the, the, the process and as it were, the recipe, the exact product will be approved and unless someone has sought uh, confidentiality and, and specific uh, protection for their information on their dossier once approved other people as long as they produce their CBD um, novel food in exactly the same way in compliance and complying with all the approvals that will have gone with it can then produce their products so some trade associations associations have sought to form consortiums and get some of the basics um, that we saw with other novel foods in the last 10 to 15 years across the line so that everyone can then pull down on that novel food approval. Um, I, I hear mixed stories about how that's going and whether that has created a real opportunity to get a number of things across the line sooner to the benefit of the, of the sector but also as I say some sensitivities around people wanting to protect the particular their particular methodology um, or, or particular um, constituents of, of, of how they get their product. So we as a law firm aren't in really in the business of creating consortiums. We're familiar with some and we would support um, you know, a consortium that wanted help with any of the legal aspects of getting novel food approvals. But we also work, um, obviously, as lawyers in strict confidence with people who may or may not be pursuing things that have similarities uh, with other clients and other products that are being taken through the novel pr food approvals process. Um, I, I, there was a broad question about what are the opportunities, and I think I'll probably have to leave that one hanging. I think I think all of us on the call and our, our colleagues, our wider colleagues in the, in the cannabis support team, um, do see real opportunities. We um, know that people are wanting to make investments into this sector, uh, and that I think after quite a turbulent year with uh, various of these uh, developments in the legal sector, I think that. 2021 is providing a platform for opportunities, I would say particularly in the UK uh, for, for novel foods where we've perhaps had some of uh, less of the panic that the EU have had, um, but more broadly as well. Uh, we're a long way behind Canada and Uruguay and I don't for one moment think that we are going to get major legislative re reform in the immediate future that would really open the market up more broadly. Um, but notwithstanding the, the, the legal framework, we think there are great opportunities. Um, we plan to have a seminar at the beginning of 2021, which will particularly look at some of the new developments uh, around uh, what the markets um, have said around investments and um, uh, taking businesses uh, through flotation processes and, and similar. Um, when they relate to cannabis uh, and CBD. So for those of you who are perhaps either seeking investment um, uh, and growth for your business, or those of you who advise or are investors, I would very much hope that you would join us for our, our next webinar. Uh, and in the interim, you'll find on Field Fisher's uh, web, uh, website, a specific section that, that links you with various papers we've produced on cannabis products. Um, and I know that Chloe will probably come back to us with some of the unanswered questions and in our follow-up and thanks for your attendance, we'll try and deal with any uh, issues that seem to be uh, generic or appropriate for us to answer there.
So it just leaves me to thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope that you've uh, gained increasing opportunity to learn about issues in the sector uh, and the way that uh, we would be delighted to support businesses navigating this very difficult area. Thank you very much and goodbye.